government through the Early Learning and Care program, this picture is changing. With support for increased wages, we're able to hire well-qualified educators with a minimum of two years education specific to early childhood. To be able to get the care all in one place for all four children is incredibly um, significant in my life. It means one drop off. Having them close together as well so that they can comfort each other if they're homesick. The childcare funding that the government offers allows me to work. Without that funding, I would not be able to work, which means no income and no extra benefits. Uh, with the opportunity to apply for this early learning and care program for additional funding from the government, it was um, a fantastic surprise and we noticed um, results immediately. Uh, so for us, mainly for children with disabilities, uh, we've always been a center that sees all children as citizens. One of the components of the Early Learning and Care program brought us more resources to support these children and these families. We see a lot more support from the government as far as funding for programming for us personally that we can, you know, better ourselves as educators and we can go out and take courses and, and that kind of stuff. I think too in like working in like team situations, it's not just one person doing trying to carry the team because they're the most qualified. We're all very qualified and all have a high level of education. The Early Learning and Child Care Centers program, first of all, needs to be made permanent. It's currently a pilot program. It needs to continue well into the future. And secondly, the program needs to be expanded to many more parts of Alberta. Right now, there are 122 of these early learning and child care centers across Alberta receiving government support. We need to expand that to be way more so that parents everywhere, no matter where they are in the province, have access to the program so that they can afford care, so that the care that they get is high quality, uh, and so that the care meets the needs of their kids. <laughs> Yes, that's a little sample of what we're doing. I think that's the only video I star in, so I'm not showing you a bunch of videos of me. So we're going to get into today's session. Uh, I want to give you just a quick overview of what this session is going to look like, uh, this workshop uh, called Advocacy to Reduce and Eliminate Poverty in Alberta. Um, so we're going to take this in stages. The first stage that we're going to do um, we're going to give you kind of the lay of the land and we've got a couple of uh, excellent speakers who um, do a lot of research and advocacy um, looking into the, the context for poverty in Alberta. So we want to give you a picture of how things look right now. Um, then we're going to have a discussion period about that. We're going to have a discussion period after each one of these uh, sessions I'm going to describe. Um, then we're going to go into a little depth, more depth specifically on uh, poverty and indigenous uh, peoples in Alberta. Um, and uh, I've got an excellent speaker for that. I'll introduce them as we walk through the agenda here. Um, and then we'll have a discussion period on that. We are going to have a break in the middle, so we'll give you a chance to get up and stretch and, and refill your coffee and do anything else that you need to do. Um, and then we're going to go into some specific areas that affect poverty in Alberta. We've got a series of speakers that are going to talk about what we need, uh, some of the things that we need from governments in order to make more progress on reducing and eliminating poverty in the province. Then we'll have another discussion period. And then after that, uh, after we've had that discussion with uh, that third round of speakers, we're going to go into some table discussions and get you guys to uh, talk with each other at your tables about some ideas for how we can do effective advocacy given what we've learned in the other uh, earlier parts of the session. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll take it from there and, and, uh, and wrap up after that session. And, and we've got a speaker who's going to talk about what we do with everything moving forward uh, after we get through those table discussion sessions. Um, and that will take us right to 5 o'clock. And then, like I mentioned, we'll have a little break. We'll have the debate and the keynote uh, session later on. Um, so the purpose of the session, really, we've, uh, the past uh, two years, and now this is the third year, where we've chosen a topic that we want to go into more depth on and, and help to build some skills and knowledge and engagement. Um, we really felt like this year, poverty was a great fit. Um, for an issue that is <coughs> extremely important that you know we've done lots of work on as an organization in the past and I think many of our member organizations and individual members and people that follow our work care about this issue and it intersects with so many different uh, parts of, of our work and other areas of policy in Alberta. Um, 
so that's why we why we chose this as a session today, um, and uh, I think it's it's going to be very meaningful, and I think we're going to learn a lot of things. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to it. And um, with that, I think we're going to get right into it, and I'm going to invite um, Sandra Nago with the Edmonton Social Planning Council and Sarah Barber with End Poverty Edmonton to join us on the stage. And I think they've got some way of splitting up their uh, sessions. Sandra will go first. Okay, we're doing this one after another. So Sandra Nago is going to come up. This is uh, Sandra, and Sarah Barber with End Poverty Edmonton will come up afterwards and give you kind of the lay of the land, and then we'll have some discussion. So take it away, Sandra. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a bit of a pacer when I present, so I might wander away from the mic at some point. Um, so I just want to start off the presentation by acknowledging that we are all treaty equals, and that the Edmonton Social Planning Council and myself are doing our very best to uphold those treaty promises we've made, and we're so thankful for having the guidance of our um, Indigenous partners in the room, including, uh, I see some of you here as well. And so I'd just like to acknowledge that before we move forward. So um, who has seen the previous poverty profiles that Edmonton Social Planning Council has put out? Nice, okay. So that's, that's actually better than some of the responses I've got. Okay. <laughs> So the Edmonton Social Planning Council, we're an independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Uh, we do uh, social research in a variety of areas and we advocate for equitable social policies. And the main way we do this is through uh, data collection, research, and dissemination. Our uh, main areas of focus are low income, housing, homelessness, food security, and recently social inclusion. So as you can tell, very specific, very narrow focus, not too broad at all. Um, so we do a lot of data research and analysis, and uh, organizations who use our information include uh, nonprofit organizations, governments, and um, one of the things that we really focus on is using data to identify gaps and opportunities in the system. So, the Poverty Profile is released every two years. It's an update on the current trends and challenges that uh, the poverty and low-income sectors are experiencing. Uh, some of the questions that we try to explore through this are what are some of the trends um, and what does the overall picture look like? Who is at risk of being in low income? And um, what are some of the things that are happening in the economic and political sphere that are, that's influencing our work? So before we can really talk about solutions to low income and poverty though, we have to talk about how we measure and how we collect the data, right? Um, so there's three primary data sources. There's the census. Who here has participated in the census? Right, okay. Now who here uh, files taxes? Right, so everyone. And, but who here has participated in the Canadian Income Survey? Right, okay. So not many people. And that's because those are very different data sources. The first two, the uh, census data and the uh, tax filer data, are based off of administrative data. So it has a very high coverage of people, but not, um, the census has almost everybody, and tax filer data, 95% of people file taxes. The Canadian Income Survey, though, is a survey, and so across Canada, um, about 30,000 or so people participate in it. And then, um, Less important, though, are the measures. How do you measure? How do you measure low income? And there's a variety of measures. And I'm actually going to try to do a really quick clinic on how you can kind of explore the different measures and how um, we get the numbers that we get. Because otherwise, um, it's uh, it's a lot harder to talk about what's going on and the different measures that will illustrate different things. So I'll walk you through it very quickly. So the first measure is the low income measure. Uh, we all always use after tax in most of our measurements. Uh, this is based off of the census data and it has the most variables that are available and that's because it's tied to the census. Um, unfortunately though, um, Stats Canada really likes to make things confusing and so they've updated the measure, which I'm going to talk about very shortly. And so we can't really, um, 
there's, there's another low income measure. And this is based off of, it's called the census family me um, low income measure, which is also used after tax. And the difference between um, the LIMAD and the CF LIMAD is just that uh, they're calculated differently with uh, scaling by household size. And if you're interested in a number nerd like I am, I'm happy to give you the thresholds. The census family limit, though, that's tied to your tax filer data. And so it's a little bit more updated. And um, 2015 data is available for that. But unfortunately, it's missing a lot of um, important indicators. So you can look at tax filer data according to even gender, which is kind of a shock. Um, you also can't look at things like visible minority status, and you also can't look at things as uh, First Nations on reserve. Mm -hmm. And lastly, it's, there's a market basket measure. Who here knows about the market basket measure? Who's heard of it? Okay, so quite a few people. Um, and um, the Government of Canada recently made this our official uh, poverty line, which is great that we finally have one. Um, but the problem with the MBM right now is that it's based off of 2008 numbers, and then it's scaled up. Uh, and some things, few things have changed since 2008, right? Um, however, the, the most recent data is available for um, the MBM. And it's important to note that all of these measures, they are only income-based. They are missing a lot of things. Poverty is not only related to income, though it's, they're, have, they're tied together, but it's missing important things like social inclusion, racism, stress, well-being. These measures don't cover those things. And so when you're looking at overall indicators, like the low-income measures, make sure you keep this in mind. So one of our recommendations going forward is to expand upon the population level indicators that are available. Um, right now, we're not able to speak about LGBTQ2S plus populations. We're not able to speak to um, those living with disabilities, uh, food security, uh, mental health and physical health. They're not tied to low income right now. And uh, our food security data is also updated. The last one was collected in 2012. Okay, so I'm done talking about that. Finally, we get to the numbers. Um, so if you look at the top green line, that is your CF LIMAT data. As you can see, it's very smooth. And the way that the CF LIMAT is calculated, you have a low, higher low income prevalence, so about 13.6% of, of individuals in all of Alberta. There's the LIMAT in between at 11.1%. And those differences are largely based just off of how it's calculated. I won't go into that detail today. And then lastly, you have the MBM. Right, and so as you can see, it's a little bit bumpier, but um, who here knows what happened in uh, 2016, middle of 2016? What were some major policy changes that governments have made? Any guesses? Sarah, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the introduction of the child tax benefit. The introduction of the child, ta child tax benefit, yes, thank you. Um, so this was a very large uh, <laughs> improvement from the universal child care benefit to the uh, Canada child benefit. And it was a huge boon to low-income families across Canada. And it was implemented in the middle of 2016. And that's why we see that little dip happening at the end of the MBM. So child <laughs> poverty overall tends to be higher than um, lower than uh, child than poverty for the rest of the population. But, okay, so who here um, is, who has heard the Notley government has had child poverty in the past two years? Raise your hand if you've heard this. Right, so a lot of you. Um, and if you look here, this demonstrates that this is, this is the data set that this comes from. And if you look at it, um, you can see a very smooth decline with the MBM data. However, you don't see the same thing with the tax filer data. Why is that? Anybody have any guesses? Okay, so it's because with, um, with the MBM data, you have a very representative sample. Your data is very reliable at the national level. But once you start cutting it into smaller pieces, the data becomes a lot um, less reliable, less representative. 
So anytime you start cutting it up into smaller pieces, you don't have that same coverage rate, right? Like all of you follow your taxes, but not everybody here has participated in the Canadian Income Survey, right? And so this is the fluctuations that happen um, because of because of just the way the data is structured. So then this isn't to throw any water on um, the recent changes being made by the government, but it's perhaps to suggest that perhaps the change isn't quite as drastic as having in two years. So just keep that in mind. So what's the first thing um, that people think of when they think of living in poverty. Well, you're either in poverty or you're not, right? But that's not necessarily true. Poverty very much exists on a gradient. And uh, what this is illustrating here is the poverty gap. So this is the difference between your median income um, and uh, the low income thresholds as set out uh, by the different poverty measures. And what this is really illustrating is if you look on the far left, um, Lone parent families with one child typically have lower, in, um, uh, as a group, have lower incomes. And in order to meet the low income thresholds, they would have to double their income. Who here has last experienced a doubling of their income? Well, 100% raise. Not very recently, right? Um, <laughs> um, if you look to the far right, couples with two children are doing a bit better, but they still need to have a 40% um, income increase in order to no longer be considered low income. So when you look at it that way, the poorest, uh, the poorest among us really do um, require um, quite a substantial increase in income, and the majority of people who are in poverty are, in, are, quite, are quite deeply in poverty. Here we're going to look at, um, we're looking at breakdowns now according to different, different demographics. Uh, this is for Edmonton, but the trends do hold across Alberta. Um, couple families experience um, a lot of economic protection from being a couple. So you're cushioned against shock, uh, against shocks such as job loss and illness, um, which a lot of single adults don't really get. And that's why you see a much higher low income prevalence among single families or single parent families. Next we have uh, low income by age. Um, this is between 2015 to 2016 using uh, the tax filer data. And as you can see, it gets much lower at the age of 65, and that's due to being able to access universal benefits such as um, old age security and the guaranteed income supplement if you are low income as a senior. Next, we're looking at it by gender. Um, so overall, um, Nevena is going to speak more about this later on, but overall, women experience higher rates of low income. But if you look at, um, if you look at how that changes over time, you see that it starts off almost exactly even as children, and then as women enter the working force for a variety of reasons, uh, the low income prevalence increases, and then finally, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's quite a big difference as a senior woman, and that's actually because we tend to outlive our male counterparts, and then we become uh, those single uh, parent households that I was mentioning earlier. One thing that I think is really important to highlight is the fact that there are intersecting vulnerabilities that do happen. Um, here we have the number of female-led um, single-parent families versus male-led um, single-parent families. And so there's far less, or far fewer, male-led, single, so far less single dads, and a much uh, lower prevalence of single dads are low income compared to their uh, female counterparts. <coughs> Moving on to visible minority. Uh, one thing I really want to highlight is that these numbers are very, very broad. They are missing a lot of context, and I think that really the devils are in the details of this. And a lot of the time we tend to group visible minority groups together. But the first thing you'll notice here is that among the different uh, groups, there's a very drastic difference in low-income prevalence. Even among the black community alone, they come from more than 200 countries. And so you have to recognize that there is a lot of diversity that isn't being captured in the numbers, and that's why culturally sensitive and appropriate approaches 
are so critical. You can't brush everyone, uh, you can't paint everyone with the same brush. The same can be said of our indigenous counterparts. Uh, Cheryl will speak more about it later. Um, but uh, those who identify as um, Aboriginal, so Aboriginal is a term that Stats Canada uses. I don't prefer it, I know many others don't. But because I'm reporting on the data, that's the term that has to be used. But according to the census, in 2015, um, those identifying as Aboriginal were, were more than twice as likely to be low income than those who um, <coughs> did not. Where's my timekeeper, by the way? And then now we're at, uh, looking at Indigenous identity and how it intersects with gender. Um, as you can see here, Indigenous uh, females are uh, much more likely to be low income. So next I'm going to show you some maps by neighborhood just to look at the spatial distribution of, um, in Edmonton of those who are low income. And um, unfortunately we weren't able to do Alberta, but if someone wants to come to me with the data and wants to do some mapping, I'm more than open to it. So this is the map of um, low income neighborhoods in Edmonton. Um, they're avail they'll be available on our website if you're interested in looking at them. And as you can see, so the far left is low income prevalence for everyone. The right is for children. And so as you can see, you know, uh, we tend to think of low income being concentrated in the central part of our city and the north side. But really, there, it's quite distributed. Aside from the fairly well-off southwest, there's low income neighborhoods in the western and central south. So kind of just breaking the, that myth that we need to concentrate our services in the inner city, it's not true. Low income is distributed all throughout the city and we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about service provision. Um, and so I think, my, so my, sorry, my slides are a little out of detail, but next we're gonna talk about game changers, which Sarah is going to go more detail into. But a game changer is something that drastically changes the scenario for low-income families and gives them opportunities to thrive. Here we're looking at different sources of income um, by different family types. And this is showing the blue bar. That's showing that the vast majority of income for all family types is from employment. So we need to get away from this idea that low-income families or single-parent families are living off of government transfers. It's simply not true. They get more than they get about three quarters of their total income from employment. Next, we're looking at the low-income prevalence by industry. So the all industry average is about 5.9 percent of people who are working who are over the ages of 15. Those who work in accommodations and retail services, though. Um, across the sector, 11.8% of them are in low income. So this is talking to, this says a lot about the precarious nature of the industry, and uh, it's really important that we protect those low wage earners, as um, many of them do work on a minimum wage. And they're also working full time, not, um, there's a high prevalence of adult workers in there as well. So one of the recommendations we want to make is that we continue to provide and expand benefits to families who are living in low, pop and, and low income and to also improve programs such as Alberta Works and Niche. Um, next is affordable housing. That's a big, um, that's a big uh, contributor to people who are living in low income. In Edmonton, one in five households pay more than 30% of their housing costs on housing. And so that's the definition for um, being in core housing need. And 38% of renters spend more than 30% of, um, of their income on housing as compared to only 16.5% of homeowners. These are some fairly important um, policies that relate to housing, um, such as the National Housing Strategy, the Provincial Affordable Housing Strategy, and recently the City of Edmonton implemented Policy C601, which is an aspirational target of 16% affordable housing in each neighborhood. 
And so a really critical way of addressing housing issues is that um, we need to expand upon the affordable housing stock in Edmonton. We're short about 40,000 units or so, but some of my colleagues may have a better number than that. Um, does anybody here volunteer for the homeless count? Nice, okay, so I see a few hands. So who here has heard of the homeless count? Who? Okay, okay, great. So the homeless count is a point in time count that occurs across Alberta. Um, on one night, there's a team of volunteers um, who go out into um, shelters and to other, um, and to other uh, places where those who may be struggling with, home, with housing um, may be, and they'll t do a quick snapshot over a 24-hour period. <coughs> in Edmonton right now, in 2018, it's, t it's estimated there's about 1,900 individuals who are homeless. And, um, and about um, 1,200 of them are provisionally housed, 679 are emergency sheltered, and 70 are unsheltered. Uh, another thing that's really that's in one of our game changers are uh, affordable and accessible transportation. Uh, there's the Ride Transit program, and um, it's intended so to support Edmontonians by providing subsidized monthly bus passes. And there's about um, 38,000 uh, individuals who are using the program right now, and about 12,000 of them are youth. And a recent evaluation has come out, which um, highlights that this program is really useful for those who, who are trying to get to work, who are not really able to get to work, uh, for um, seeing their friends and addressing how um, excluded and isolated that they might feel. And it's also great to, for accessing recreation. So it's a great program and hopefully they, um, and hopefully they improve their administrative process so that eventually everybody who needs a low income bus pass will get one. I'm gonna skip over the um, affordable and quality childcare just because some of our colleagues um, are much more well versed in that than I. And that's it, thank you. providing such a thorough overview of the numbers in Edmonton. So now what I would like to do actually is <clears throat> talk about End Poverty Edmonton as a response to the state of poverty in Edmonton. So this presentation will take you through a little bit about our origin story, uh, talk to you a little bit about our structure, uh, the game changer approach again that Sandra has mentioned, and then I'll give a little bit of detail about some of the uh, progress on some of the roadmap actions. And then finally, I'm going to end with our educational initiative, campaign, um, and how you can help us take action on poverty during this election period. Okay. And Poverty Edmonton started as a council initiative and uh, in 2013, and then with the election of Mayor Don Iveson that year, the council initiative then became uh, the mayor's task force. Um, through the next couple of years, the task force convened multiple working groups in the areas of community well-being, early childhood development, economic security, education, health and wellness, housing and transportation, justice and democratic participation and included an Aboriginal roundtable and an information and research roundtable. So you can kind of see that with all of those different sectors involved, um, that's kind of how the, the concept of game changers started to emerge. 
The working groups and roundtables spent months talking to the people of Edmonton about their experiences of poverty and their hopes for a way to end it. So in 2015, the task force presented End Poverty in a Generation a strategy. <coughs> oh no, I grabbed the wrong white book. Oh, for goodness sakes. I'm just going to wave a book up and say that this is a strategy, but I don't have that. Um, but you can actually access the strategy, the full strategy, on the End Poverty Edmonton website. So, um, And that really is kind of our seminal document, I would say, and it's, it's worth a read for all of those who are interested. Um, and then it was met with unanimous approval that year. So the strategy aligned 28 priorities identified by over 3,000 Edmontonians that were engaged in the process. Um, that document was also the document that introduced the idea of game changers, which I'll talk about more later. And then so with this strategy in hand, the task force worked on the, impl the first implementation plan which distilled uh, over 400 recommendations by these task groups into 35 roadmap actions. And that is, uh, that has become the End Poverty in a Generation, our roadmap. Um, and again, this is, we don't have any more printed copies available uh, of this, but you can access this full document on the endpovertyedmonton.ca website as well. Hold it up. The red, we call it the red book, or the red Bible at the secretariat. <laughs> um, so that's, that has the details about what exactly End Poverty Edmonton is undertaking in, the, in its first five years. Um, and then that was approved by council in 2016. So finally, End Poverty Edmonton became an independent nonprofit organization through the development of the Secretariat in mid-2017. And since that time, the Secretariat has hired staff, convened tables, and begun the foundation work of setting up the structure for the community <laughs> to work within and for the initiative to operate. This is... This is a picture of our structure. It's, um, I think it will see some evolution over the next little while, but I'll talk to you a bit about how it was envisioned to be set up. So the um, End Party Edmonton is a collective impact initiative comprised of people who represent agencies, orders of government, citizens with lived experience, service providers, and many others with an interest in ending poverty. So the center circle that you see, it sort of model looks a bit like a drone actually, but um, <laughs> the, so the, the center part of the drone is the stewardship round table and um, Cheryl Whiskey Jack is the, which who will be speaking after us, um, is one of the co-chairs for the stewardship round table. So this group is the leadership table for the community, providing oversight to the roadmap and reporting progress back to the community at large. It is comprised of representatives from um, each of the other circles, so the investment collective, the indigenous <coughs> excuse me, uh, circle, uh, service providers, and other key partners. Um, the little circle off to the upper right is the investment collective, and uh, these are this group is our key, is composed of our key funders. Uh, for End Poverty Edmonton, and that includes the City of Edmonton, Government of Alberta, United Way, Edmonton Community Foundation, and the Stollery Foundation. And then the other circle next to the Investment Collective is uh, the Indigenous Circle, and it's a fluid and open membership table inclusive of all Indigenous peoples and communities in Edmonton. It includes elders, knowledge keepers, and cultural resource people, and encourages the participation of those who have seen poverty, as well as um, trying to encourage Indigenous youth to join. Um, so the next two circles, the bottom part of uh, the drone, is, uh, are, are not quite as far along in their development. Um, so one of those circles is a stakeholder forum, and it's meant to be a group of lived experience leaders, people with a lived living, living experience of poverty, who have chosen to contribute to End Poverty Edmonton in order to advocate and share their knowledge. Um, so this will ideally include representatives from communities of people who experience higher rates of poverty as, as those people that Sandra mentioned. 
So people coming from newcomer communities, low-income workers, um, at-risk youth, vulnerable women, um, individuals who are homeless seniors and those with disabilities, as well as Indigenous um, Edmontonians. <laughs> The Count Me In network, um, which completes the model there, is meant to be composed of community members and partners from cross-sectoral groups working at ending poverty within the Game Changers. This would include um, content experts, academics, industry members, orders of government, sector agencies, business members, and nonprofits. And then finally, the out, no, oh, it's very faint on here, uh, the outside dotted circle <coughs> excuse me, is, uh, represents the Secretariat of which I am a part of. So this currently comprises five staff covering um, executive direction, community engagement, communications, and uh, I fill the research and evaluation role there. And back to the game changers. So when you think about what we need to do to end poverty, it can feel incredibly overwhelming. Um, so breaking down the overall picture into actionable areas uh, can help make things a little bit easier to digest. So this is essentially what the game changer, um, what the game changers are. They're actionable areas, areas that impact people's lives. So basically a game changer is a priority area that we know if we impact change within that area, we will make a contribution to the overall goal of ending poverty. So End Poverty Edmonton has identified six game changers. We could have identified more, um, such as education, um, food security, this kind of thing. And um, if you look at anti-poverty strategies across the country and, and, um, or across North America, you'll see that most of these strategies have identified core game changers. In Toronto, they call them pillars. Um, and others have more, others have fewer, but there is a lot of continuity um, across the areas that people are addressing. So uh, the first one that we have identified um, is actually unique to End Poverty Edmonton, and that's to eliminate racism. Um, so we know that racism is one of the key factors that keep many minorities and, and indigenous people in the downward cycle of poverty. Eliminating systematic racism will remove <coughs> the barriers that people face in accessing economic, social, and cultural activities required to participate fully in society. The second one is livable incomes, and uh, livable incomes, of course, is the amount of income an individual or family needs to meet basic needs and maintain a safe, decent standard of living in their community. Again, as Sandra mentioned, um, affordable housing is one of the key game changers here, and we know that affordable housing is a serious challenge in Edmonton, where one in five people um, are unable to um, really afford the housing that they have and you know in some groups that we've worked with we know that between upwards of 50 to 100 uh, percent or some people are spending between upwards of 50 to 100 percent of their income on housing um, and again accessible and affordable transit is a key factor in enabling people to access the work and um, other supports that they need to function as well, affordable and quality child care. Um, so we know a high quality early learning and care is essential to provide children with the skills they need to succeed. Without these supports, children can easily remain in the cycle of intergenerational poverty. And not to mention, just like in the video that you showed, Joel, at, at the beginning, people need child care to go to work. They need, they need it to make sense for them to go to work. They don't want to pay their entire salary to child care, which um, is certainly possible to do here. Um, and then finally, uh, we have uh, identified access to mental health services and addiction support um, as a key <coughs> game changer, because we know that people with mental illness often live in chronic poverty, and then conversely, Poverty can be a significant risk factor for poor physical and mental health. So the next set of slides, I'll give you a little bit of update about some of our key activities in each of the game changer areas. Um, so 
I realized that the font size is incredibly small, which is great because then I can just make stuff up <laughs> and you won't know. So, <laughs> just kidding. Um, more than, uh, so a couple of our initiatives to address eliminating racism that um, the Edmonton Police Service, um, more than 55% of their staff now, plus 100 victim advocates, have uh, taken courses around working with Indigenous communities and understanding historic trauma. And uh, this is now a mandatory um, course for all Edmonton Police Service staff. So that's a, a large step forward in, in that area. As well, more than 200 City of Edmonton staff participated in intercultural competency workshops that are now mandatory for the city's entire social development branch. And um, one, of, one of our um, social innovation uh, project, projects is the Shift Lab. Um, and their first iteration of the Shift Lab, they brought people together to generate three prototypes where they're addressing the intersection between racism and housing. Um, so right now, those prototypes have gone to Edmonton Community Fund Foundation for further support, so I'm sure we'll see more about those actions uh, coming up very shortly. <laughs> Under livable incomes, um, E4C's Make Tax Time Pay program is one of um, the key initiatives in, in helping um, over 4,800 people to file tax returns who might not otherwise, which then has allowed them to access more than $11.5 million, you know, when you spread that out over everybody in um, accessing income supports and benefits that they're um, entitled to. Uh, so we know that makes a huge impact in the daily lives of the people who can finally access those. Um, in uh, last year, the city of Edmonton uh, drafted and passed a living wage policies so that um, now nobody who is employed by the city of Edmonton can make less than a living wage. Um, so that's a significant step forward. As well, uh, one of the, I don't know if people are farmer's market goers here, probably. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the Indigenous Market Collective on the 104th Street Farmers Market downtown this summer. Um, that's one of the End Poverty Edmonton initiatives. So it's a group of Indigenous artists who have come together to help support each other in help bringing their art to market, as well as raising awareness about um, uh, appro uh, cultural appropriation. So that's another initiative that we have under the Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. <laughs> no, Joel. <laughs> um, oh, and a quarter or a, a cornerstone <coughs> initiative of N Party Edmonton was the development and further funding of the Edmonton Community Development Company, which has seen ten million dollars in land transfers from the city of Edmonton so far. Um, and their first proposed project is the or the Arts Common 118th Ave, which is a neighborhood renewal project that will develop semi-aid affordable live to work. Uh, studios for artists, two floors of market space for artists and other local businesses, a community arts coffee shop um, as a community building hive, performance exhibit, exhibition and collaborative spaces for up to 200 people, just to name a few of the benefits brought by that project, but they're also working in multiple neighborhoods on affordable housing development as well as community economic initiatives. So we'll be seeing a lot more from them as we go forward. And I'm going to skip over this because Sandra talked about this. Uh, apart from, I just wanted to mention that the City of Edmonton Ride Transit Program, which is the Affordable Bus Pass Program, has gone further from pilot and is now an officially funded uh, program that will be funded on an ongoing basis. Yay. <laughs> Though it's not as cheap as Calgary's, I have to say. Ours is $35 a month and theirs is five. Oh. That's right. We have a 35 bed. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, there are stirred, stirred some stuff up there. Um, and then I'm going to leave it to Nikki to talk about um, the Early Learning and Care Council that is being developed as part of um, N Poverty Edmonton. 
initiative and sorry, All In For Youth is also another um, cornerstone project of End Poverty Edmonton and it's roadmap action number 30 if you're looking in the red book and All In For Youth is helping thousands of kids in five pilot schools um, and so it's looking at it's uh, supporting children from kindergarten through grade 12 and um, they are offering a number of, they're looking at schools as a community and supporting um, children and their families um, within the school environment to access all kinds of service that they might need. Um, so that's another really great initiative and All In For Youth is having a celebration in May and um, they're going to invite anybody who wants to come and hear about it and I would really encourage you to do so because it's a really unique model and um, they're really providing valuable wraparound support services for kids and, and their families. And, it, and so far, over the last couple of years, it's, it's seen some really um, promising indicators of success. <coughs> um, access to mental health uh, services and addiction supports. So, um, I, I'm looking at one of the key members of the Mental Health Action Plan Steering Committee right now. Tammy, you're not looking at me. Now you're looking at me. Great. Um, you, so you can harass her during the break to hear more about the Mental Health Action Plan Steering Committee. And uh, they are addressing mental health and it is a very large uh, partnership initiative that is aiming to improve access to services. They are, they are looking at ways to increase access to mental health services and supports through improving systems navigation and establishing a living library of experts to help inform mental health practice and policy development. I plus, think. Plus many other things. And add and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, great example, Sarah, thanks. So reconciliation is not a game changer per se. But it is something that we see permeating our entire strategy and, and going through everything that we do. So as Sandra mentioned, Indigenous people experience economic poverty at a rate of two and a half times that of others. The reasons for this vary from person to person, but a lot of it can be directly attributed to the legacy of colonialism and residential schools. End Poverty Edmonton sees ending poverty as a profound act of reconciliation and as such considers reconciliation a primary goal that underpins all activities, like I said. EPE tables and groups rely on the EPE Indigenous Circle to inform and advise on ways to advance reconciliation throughout the entire strategy. Cheryl, I don't know if you want to mention that. Um, okay. <laughs> oh my god, I don't want to get to so much. Um, the, uh, this is our number one action in our roadmap, and it's the development of the Indigenous Culture and Wellness Centre. Um, and it's a, a key to help us work towards re reconciliation and to design a plan, uh, to design and plan an Indigenous Culture and Wellness Centre, and it will be Indigenous-led. It will be a cultural and spiritual place inclusive for all Indigenous peoples and a place for ceremony, traditional healing, and indigenous cultural healing. So it's currently in the business case for a uh, stage formation, and the next step is to access funding to actually begin building and designing, designing and then building um, that. So that will be a really exciting thing for our city to finally have. And finally, um, changing the conversation, again, not a game changer, but part of changing the conversation includes raising awareness, changing perceptions about how people end up in poverty, and making the existence of poverty not okay anymore. We don't want it to be just an unfortunate and inevitable consequence of our social and economic system any longer. That's what we're doing. We're trying to change the conversation. It's not okay anymore. Which brings us to our Let's Do This Education Initiative campaign. Um, so as part of our work to advance advocacy and to change the conversation, we're currently in the middle of the Let's Do This uh, Election Education Initiative. And I have a couple. So, uh, so what, this, what the primary aim of this is to do is its purpose is to educate Albertans about the impact of poverty on our province, highlight areas where we can take action on poverty, 
and help make poverty uh, part of the conversation as we prepare to elect Alberta's next MLAs. Um, we actually have a series of six videos. I'm just going to show you three little clips. They're 15 seconds each, so in case people are starting to. Know. <laughs> She's showing us videos now. <laughs> There's one for each of the game changers, and I think there's an overall one that made so maybe there's seven. But you can go to the Let's Do This uh, Alberta.ca website. You can see all the videos there. You can see news uh, pieces that have been generated over the past few weeks um, addressing uh, the game changer areas uh, in the media. And you can also log into the website and figure out who your candidates, you enter your postal code in there, and it shows you who your candidates are, and then you can send a form letter um, to your candidates asking them about how they plan to address poverty <laughs> in the upcoming election. So that's kind of the key um, component to the campaign. Uh, education initiative. Um, yeah, so what you can do is you can go to um, the Al Let's Do This Alberta and uh, email your candidates. Talk to your candidates at the door about talking about action on poverty. Talk to your friends and neighbors and colleagues. Share the let's do this uh, stuff in your social media. Request brochures to distribute. I brought up, I know it's in your conference package, but I brought a lot of other brochures. Let's do this. So if you want to take them back to your workplace, there's a pile of them at the front door. So feel free to take them. Oh, yeah. no, uh, this. Let's do this. And uh, yeah, so feel free to take them back. You can also order more from us. Um, and yeah, and then we would encourage you again to write letters and et cetera, et cetera. On to MLA? Yes, it goes to all of your MLA candidates, yeah. Um, and it's something that we might look at repurposing for the fall federal election as well. Um, yeah. So if you haven't done so already and you'd like to stay connected to End Poverty Edmonton, go to our endpovertyedmonton.ca website and sign up for our newsletter as well. You can follow us on social, on Twitter or Facebook. And uh, I just wanted to say that um, if, if you're interested, we're hosting a universal basic income learn all about it lunch um, in, on April 25th and it's under our news and events section. If you go to the webpage and you can um, sign up for the Eventbrite invitation there, that, that, done, done, that's it. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sarah. I think it's Ben's mic on. You can stay up here, though, and we'll get Sandra to come up, because we're going to have a short discussion period here. Um, if uh, folks have comments or questions, we're going to try to keep it short, uh, because we have a lot of stuff to pack into the agenda. But, um, if you want to raise your hand, we've got a volunteer, Lynn, here, who is going to uh, run the mic around, uh, and Laura as well, uh, who is our communications officer at Public Interest Alberta. Uh, so just stick up your hand. Uh, we've got time for a few people to uh, chime in here if you'd like at this point, and we'll have more opportunities later on in the agenda as well. So one in the middle here. And never know, front here. Go ahead. I, I, I'm Denise Meyer, and I'm here with EDLC, but I'm also from ATU 569, which represents the bus drivers and ETS. And just a piece of information that wasn't included in your little blurby is not only the bus passes, but uh, Transit runs a program called Donate a Ride, that they, people donate money, tickets, whatever they, they like to buy books of tickets. And last year, I believe there were over 36,000 uh, tickets that were 
which is uh, on behalf of the, uh, the people that donated money to give to all the agencies that uh, cross Edmonton that they can give them to for, for people that need rides. <laughs> I'm uh, Nevin Ivanovich. Um, I'll speak a little later, but uh, now I have a, a sort of a cheeky question for Sandra. Um, uh, it's about uh, the LIM or LIM as a poverty measure. So, how do we end poverty if you know LIM is 50% of the median income? Um, you know, like what is the rationale? Like, you know, it's it's usually used for international comparison. It's a great um, uh, indicator of inequality in society, and that's something that we also want to tackle. Um, but how do you, you know, how do you see uh, it outweigh, you know, how is it a more useful measure uh, than the NBM of poverty in a, in a provincial or a city context? Just wondering your opinion. Oh, okay, that's a good question. Um, so my first, um, the first one, well, you, you mentioned it already, it talks about income inequality. And um, Whitehall did a landmark study back in, I believe, 2002 that demonstrated that rather than uh, absolute measures of uh, well-being, that it's really about the relativity and how you, well you're doing compared to your neighbors. Um, I might be able to afford shoes and um, eat a basic diet or um, live with a roof over my head, but if my roof is leaky and my neighbor's is not, that there's a lot of social aspects that the low-income measures don't get at. And I think that the best way that you can control for kind of changes in how everyone's doing is with those relative measures. But that's a good question, though, because technically with the limb, you're never going to reach a zero, right? Like, it's not possible with the way the number is structured. Um, Although you can get very low theoretically, theoretically, but you are right. Thanks, Stefana. We have one more, and we'll have lots of opportunities later on in the agenda. But if we have one more question or comment for now, um, hi. Um, is anyone from city planning and ever consulted or part of your planning and consultation? Uh, it used to contain a research arm where there's research design and, and uh, controls. 60 years ago, I worked for city planning research and uh, when I was a new geography graduate. And at that time, we were working on a 1980 master plan, especially with respect to transportation. And it was very discouraging that our plans for rapid transit were overridden by money interests who wanted highways and so on. But still, the planning research used to be involved with this kind of planning, and I wonder if they're involved now. Um, so that's a good question. So City of Edmonton will occasionally contact us if they need specific work done. Um, we have done project-specific <coughs> things uh, with them before. However, it's, uh, it's we are separate from the city and so we aren't under any obligation to do continuous work for them. Uh, that being said though, I know that they do have, um, rather than a research branch, they will have people who do research within specific branches, so it's more dispersed now rather what? than a specific. Maybe contract work? Um, not necessarily contract work. I know a lot of them are to kind of dedicated to one thing. Um, so you'll have people who work specifically in research in, so in the social sector, people who work specifically in research and housing, that kind of thing, rather than, um, rather than one big arm. Great. Okay, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up for that little part of the session. Thank you to Sandra and Sarah again. Uh, so our next speaker isn't listed in the program because we talked to her so last minute. I want to give an extra thank you to her for uh, being here um, on fairly short notice. But Cheryl Whiskey Jack is the executive director of the Bentero Traditional Healing Society uh, and is going to talk to us uh, about poverty and ind indigenous peoples in Alberta. So please welcome Cheryl Whiskey Jack.
peek at everybody while I was sitting there. Um, so, I'm really glad I'm following these two ladies because some of the things I wanted to try to cover you covered, so that's good. But one of the things that they didn't cover, and I, I didn't have time to get any slides together, so I'm just going to read for you off of the white book that uh, Sarah forgot. There's actually a definition of poverty that we worked really hard to land on. Um, I was a part of the uh, elimination of poverty. Uh, the very first group, to the group where the work we're presently doing in Antarctica, and so since 2013 on that slide, I've been involved in this work. Um, so the definition that we landed on, uh, we took definitions from many different sources, and none of them seemed to uh, fit or um, satisfy all the people that were involved in creating the definition that we finally landed on. And one of the big sticking points came from actually the Indigenous community because we talked about poverty as not being just a uh, uh, a lack of resources or access to resources. We talked about it as being um, a lack of access to um, culture, language, all of those things. So the actual definition is poverty is defined as when people lack or are denied economic, social, and cultural resources to have a quality of life that sustains and facilitates full and meaningful participation in the community. And I think one of the reasons why that me and my role as executive director of uh, Betero um, saw such a fit in this work isn't just because a lot of people that we serve are struggling with poverty. It's not because of that. It's because it's actually a really good fit with the uh, mission that Betero has. Again, I wish I had a slide. Uh, our mission statement is long and wordy as mission statements can be. But it's basically about helping uh, Indigenous people be successful. And the way we see them being successful is by having a foot firmly planted in two worlds. So being able to sort of live in this urban setting and um, be able to benefit from all the opportunities that it, ha that it has to offer, but also being uh, firmly grounded in culture, um, language, community, all of those things. And that if you are, the likelihood of you being a person in poverty is really going to be um, diminished. And I think the slides that you ladies presented really demonstrate that. Uh, when you talk about two out of three Indigenous people living in poverty, I, I always look at myself growing up here. We came here uh, because of the opportunities this province had to offer. We're originally from Ontario. And one of the reasons why I think we thrived was because we had those feet firmly planted in two worlds when we, when we got here. Um, so very quickly, all we needed to do when we got here was to establish um, where we fit in the community once we got here. And once we had that, you know, we, we had all the pieces in place that we needed to, to thrive. Um, so I wanted to talk about the definition. The other thing I wanted to talk about, and you guys covered the game changers, and I really appreciate that. And I, I think the um, first game changer, which is to eliminate racism, is the one that I really want to focus um, my time with you on. Uh, I was going to be smart and set a timer, which I've now done. So at 15 minutes, it's going to tell me I have five minutes left. Um, so around. Um, the game changer around eliminating racism. When you look at all the other game changers that Sarah talked about, um, those are pretty universal, right? And pretty um, common sense. Right? <coughs> if you have affordable childcare, that really helps. If you have safe and affordable housing, that really helps. But the topic of racism and eliminating racism, to me, is the game changer that is the game changer of all game changers. Um, uh, I want to talk about how there is a real struggle with tackling this game changer, um, not only here in Edmonton or in Alberta, but also in Canada, that it is so embedded in our own Canadian identity that it really is something that we really have to be focused on and really deliberate about um, changing that um, conversation and being able to sort of address all of the ways that it impacts people who are living in poverty. I want to say that uh, in my experience that media is really implicit in that embedding that is in our Canadian psyche for um, Indigenous people. When you look at the news or read any story in the paper, um, it just feeds that narrative 
that indigenous people are um, suffering, they're less than, they're wanting, you know, that, that it's just not a very good narrative. And one of my missions in life is to get out there and change the narrative um, that, that this country has for indigenous people. And I really see the work that we do at Empowering Edmonton and also the work that I do at Ventero as a, as a vehicle to do that. So when our founders um, started our organization, I, I talked about the mission statement. It's been the mission statement of our organization since the day it started. Our founders were Brad and Chana Seneca, and they themselves were a living embodiment of our mission statement, and they actually were from two worlds. Uh, Shauna Seneca was born, uh, born and raised here in Edmonton, and is Scottish generations and generations back in her family tree. Um, and Brad Seneca, her husband, uh, was is Indigenous, um, originally from Southern Ontario, really grounded in culture, grounded in our teachings, and so they came together and started this organization. We started 25 years ago. This is our 25th year of uh, being in, in service here in Edmonton, and um, when we started, we were probably 90 plus percent Indigenous in our staffing model. Today we have almost 200 staff and we are now more uh, of our staff are not Indigenous than are Indigenous. The difference um, that we make though is that um, our governance model at Bentero is Indigenous and our practice model at Bentero is Indigenous. And the reason why we have the success we do in working with our community is because of our practice model. So we have Last count, last time I looked, it was 67% of our staff were not Indigenous, but we have grounded them in Indigenous practice, and that's how they practice with every program, whether it's um, early childhood development programming, or housing, or employment, or the work that we're doing with children's services. It's all grounded in our, in our teachings. Um, the other thing that really um, helped us in that work was to um, create a way where um, create a way where we could replicate um, the way we work out in the community. So when uh, Brad and Shauna Seneca started the organization, um, one of the ways that they believed that uh, we could um, uh, help the work along was by doing our work in partnership. They didn't want our organization and the people that we serve to be an island. They wanted, um, they wanted them to feel that the way that they were served when they came to our organization, they wanted them to feel like that when they went to a city of Edmonton Wicket, when they went to the Edmonton Public Library, when they were served by uh, maybe our, our, our police service here in Edmonton. So no matter where they went, they wanted them to be able to feel like they could get that service there. And um, we did a lot of work in partnership and developing partnership with these organizations so that um, they understood our community better, that they had training, um, and the trainings even evolved. So 20 years ago, um, we used to do, and, and in a lot of places it still happens, we used to do Aboriginal cultural awareness training. How many in the room have had that kind of training? So a lot, right? And in that training, it's like, maybe it's a day, maybe it's a couple of days, and if you're lucky, it's more than a couple of days. But for sure in that training, um, they covered colonization, they covered residential schools, they covered 60s scoop, they covered historical trauma. And one of the things that we learned at our organization, um, I, I learned from our very wise staff actually, um, we have a cultural team that provides that training in our organization. And I found out one day by accident that um, they changed how they deliver that training to all of our staff. So it's a mandatory training in our organization no matter what program you work in, even if you're working reception, uh, if you're in our accounting department, or in any of the service delivery areas that we have, you have to take this training. And we provide it in-house. And so one day I was on the main floor, right across from the room where they were doing the training, and I watched our staff walk out of that room and they kind of floated out of the room, like they weren't walking. And um, I went, wow, what are, you, what are you guys doing in that room? And, uh, <laughs> They had this aura, this very calm aura around them. And, and they kind of looked back at the room and they said, oh, we're doing uh, indigenous cultural awareness teachings. That's what we call it now. And I said, oh, wow, that 
thinking in my head, I gotta talk to the facilitators and see what it is they're doing in that room. And so I did. I talked to the manager at our next supervision and I asked, what are you doing in there? Like the staff were floating out of there. And they said they really loved it. Um, they really uh, were getting a lot out of it. And he had to think about it for a second. And then he kind of went, oh yeah, well we, we changed the curriculum. And I'm like, you did? Like, oh, okay, well tell me more. And he said that uh, we don't talk about anything bad. He says, we talk about our teachings, we talk about our values, we talk about our connection to the land, we talk about our ceremonies, and we talk about how all of those things are there to help us. And that's what we talk about for two days. He says, there's a time and a place to learn about residential schools, there's a time and a place to learn about 60s scoop and historical trauma. There's lots of training that, out there that's available. But that's not who we are. So when you talk about Aboriginal awareness, that's not who Aboriginal people are. We aren't residential schools, we aren't 60s school, we aren't historical trauma, even though those things happened. So um, the, the byproduct of training in this way is that 67% of our staff are non-Indigenous. They're getting um, the good picture of our Indigenous community, the strengths, the resiliency, all of those things that we need to know to show and support our families and our uh, community how to take care of themselves. And they end up leaving our training feeling very empowered to be able to serve our families. And one of the things we did was we went back to people like 20 years ago that we were doing the two-day uh, Aboriginal awareness training that we used to do. And we talked to them about how did that make you feel when you got that training. And one of the things that we learned was that it, um, it actually made them feel a little more stressed when they went out to practice whatever it was that that program needed. So if they were a home visitor, it made them more aware of all this historical trauma that these families had experienced. And then they didn't know where to start, right? I'm here because they need help with um, raising this little child and give them strategies to do that, but now I'm really aware of all this historical trauma, and now I don't know where to start. So training in this way was a really profound difference in how all of our practitioners came at the work, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about while I was up here um, was, I saw it in your slide, Sarah, um, and I didn't know how much time I would have to tell stories, but um, you talked about the training that happened with the um, our organization was a really um, involved partner in how that training um, was created and how it was delivered. And our first uh, cohort of uh, EPE members were 800 plus patrolmen and women uh, that we trained in late 2013, early 2014. And we did that to get them prepared for the TRC gathering that was going to be happening in March of 2014. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my career, but the gifts we got from doing training in this way with our Edmonton Police Service ha are still coming in. Um, it was an opportunity for us to work with police, and I know they're still doing the training, but we were a part of the original cohort. And it gave us the opportunity to have some really, really honest, and difficult conversations with our police service who are also <coughs> serving Indigenous people every day. Um, we did it in about 16 groups, about 50 to 55 officers in every group, and um, they talked about what they see on beats every day and in the work that they're doing every day. And it is that really downtrodden negative image people have, right? And they talked about how um, there is a real disconnect for these officers between what they see in their everyday life when they're just Joe Blow citizen to when they get on the, in that squad car and are out there um, working their, their area. They see the downtrodden, right? Laying in their own um, urine on a park bench out of their minds uh, from addictions or mental health. Um, and then they're in Spruce Grove when they get off shift and they don't see anything in between and so the in-between stuff is what we had discussion about with the officers when uh, when we had that opportunity and that training and it was a really difficult conversation to have but the dividends that it played like I said earlier are still coming in um, one of them was about 
three months after the training that we did with all those 800 officers, um, we got a call from the chief's office that said um, we, one of our members passed away and the families requested that Terrell be at the service. And we went, oh, okay, um, who, who, who passed away? And they said, uh, Joe, Joe Will passed away. I'm just making that up. It wasn't Joe Will. But um, we all looked at each other and went, do you know, do you know who Joe Will is? And we didn't, none of us knew. So we sent two or three of our staff to the service, and when they came back with the memory card and showed us the memory card, I looked at Joe Will, and I still didn't know who he was. Um, he was 29 years old, so early on in his career, um, and he was not Indigenous, and um, he had um, minor surgery on his Achilles, and that's how he ended up passing away. It was very sad, but the reason why the family wanted us at the service is because um, he could not stop talking about what he learned in that training. Every day, he talked about what he learned. He looked at the news in a different way. He, he looked at the world in a different way because of how impactful that training was. And um, as hard as it was for us to go through all 16 groups um, when we did that training, I really appreciated hearing that story from the family because it showed that he was 29 years old, he was at the beginning of his career, and had he lived, his whole career would have been impacted by this training that he got, right? So it just shows the power of um, doing things in a different way and being brave enough to have those conversations, um, the, the kind of results it has. Another story from that training was um, we had a lived experience component of every group that came through, and there were people that were connected to our agency. And they were notorious to the police. So the police knew who these people were. They had dealt with them. They, they put them in jail. They arrested them. All of those things. And um, they went up there for an hour and a half and they told their story from their first memory to the day they stood in front of those officers. And in telling that story, the officers learned that they didn't grow up wanting to be a gangbanger. They didn't grow up wanting to be a prostitute. They didn't grow up with all these things. But life happened, right? Lots of forks in the roads happened, and they ended up taking the wrong fork at some way through fault of their own, or maybe through not fault of their own. Um, but it was a really powerful uh, learning opportunity for our officers, and years later, like maybe even three, three years later, uh, one of our lived experience people had a domestic violence call made to her home, and she um, came to tell us the story the day after, and her and her partner got into a really, really uh, loud um, and violent uh, fight. Police were called, police came in, one officer took her partner this way, and another officer took her this way, and all she cared about was her partner. What are you doing with him? Where are you taking him? What are you doing to him? And her officer said, he's okay, I want to be with you, I want to find out what happened here. And she's like, no, I want to know where you, what are you doing to him? What are you doing to him? Where are you taking him? Why are you taking him in another room? And she had peppered this with a lot of swear words, and I'm not doing that. And, um, and her officer said, I don't know, she says to her officer, you don't effing understand. She says to her officer, and her officer says, well, I thought I understood. She goes, what are you talking about? And he says, well, when you did that training with our, with our group, I thought I understood. But I, I guess I don't understand, so please help me understand. So in telling the story the next day when she came to our agency, she said, I had to quit treating him like an asshole because he did understand. <laughs> um, so to me, those are gifts that show that when you are brave in having these conversations, you have about five minutes left. When you're brave in having these conversations, um, these are the dividends that it pays off. Um, when we did those trainings with those officers, I got yelled at, I got swore at. Um, I got told, I'm so sick of your effing whining from these officers. Um, they were able to put their really uh, racist beliefs down on paper because that was one of the exercises that we had um, throughout the day. And when they put them on paper, we were able to discuss them. Where does that come from and why do you think it's okay to, to carry that belief around? So it was really powerful. Um, the reason why they did that was because of the TRC, and so the TRC was a moment in time, and the calls to action are for us to all respond to as we go forward, from 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 Joe Citizen all the way up to people who are, are making our policies and, and um, creating legislation for us.
So everyone in between has an opportunity to have impact on those calls to action. So that would be my, my call to action to all of you, is to, in whatever way you have, to be able to do that. Uh, the Let's Do This campaign is a really great opportunity. Uh, when we launched it, I went on and did my own. There's a form letter there, so if you're really pressed for time or lazy, you can just send that letter. But you can also add your own stuff into that letter as well. And I added my own stuff into that letter. Um, the Indigenous Cultural and Wellness Center. I'll just finish off with that. So um, um, it's a really good example of how important it is to think of um, <coughs> even processes such as the procurement and creation of this Indigenous Health and Wellness Center and how important it is to do that in a way that is respectful to the Indigenous community. So if we procure that process in the way that we procure other services, it would be yet another example of something that is given to us that is not from us or about us or created by us. And we were very vocal at the Indigenous Circle about creating um, a process with the city that was going to incorporate those parts of our way of being and looking at the world that were important to consider in creating the business case, not even creating and procuring the company that was going to create the business case for this uh, Indigenous Health and Wellness Center. And so uh, Sarah had it on her slide that it was grounded in ceremony but didn't really speak to it. And we spoke, we spoke to, the, to the city about how important it is to ground that process in ceremony. And we so strongly believe that if you ground it in ceremony, that um, it, will, um, it will be guided to the place that it needs to be and it will become the thing that we want it to be as a community. And then I'll finish off by saying um, that the other way that we see a way forward in this work um, around eliminating racism, which is one of the game changers in poverty, um, is we as an organization, with the support of our government, have created um, a way to um, share our knowledge with everybody. So on May 2nd to the 5th this year, and it's going to be our third annual, we have a culture camp at Betero, um, and we are able to offer this camp for everybody for no charge. But there will be eight TPs on the north field. We're in a closed Edmonton Public School, so we have all this great green space outside of our school. It's Parkdale School. Um, and we have four TPs on the north field, four TPs on the south field, and a sweat lodge that's up for four days. We're filling every one of those TPs with all the teachers <coughs> and elders who are going to share their teachings with our colleagues and with our community and with our families. So if you want to learn more, please take that opportunity to come. We think. Um, I believe that um, we don't just have to live in two worlds. You're on Indian land, so you live in two worlds as well. So come and learn about the original people of this land, and, and we have an opportunity for you to do that. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Uh, questions and comments, and so we'll take Hopefully we can keep it to about three because we're running a little bit behind time and then we're going to have a quick break. So we'll start with Peter because I know you had your hand up about last time, Peter. Go ahead. Just a quick question. You mentioned an event at Parkdale School, but you didn't mention the date unless I didn't hear it. Yeah. May 2nd to the 5th. Um, yeah. Uh, May of this year. Yeah. So 2nd is Thursday, 3rd is Friday. We did that deliberately so that our professional colleagues in the community come in and can come and experience that. And then obviously the last two days are on the weekend, so families, kids and families can come and attend. I'm gonna, if there's, you've spoken once uh, already, Kevin, so I'm going to go to a couple of others, uh, unless there are not. Oh, sorry, come back to you. So I think I'm kind of loud here. Are there a couple of, uh, one or two others? Or if not, then. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Just a quick question. Uh, what, uh, you, you referred to the 60s, and I'm wondering what that was. Right? The 60s school? What was it? 60s scoop? Scoop? Yeah. I don't know what that is. Oh, so that is a time in the 60s um, where um, uh, a lot of Indigenous children were taken from their homes oh. and placed in adoptive and foster homes, in non-Indigenous foster and adoptive homes, not just in Canada, but in the States and all over the world. Um, so um, a lost generation of people um, that we're still working at, bringing back into the circle today. Yeah. 
School of Assisi, and now it's uh, native, uh, Indigenous Studies. How do you see that as like going forward? Is that a very successful program? Um, I, I think it, I think it's a great idea. Again, um, you know, if our kids are having the opportunity in our schools that we pay taxes for to learn about the history of uh, people here and what what our beliefs and worldview is, and all the other children are learning the same thing. I think that's I think that's wonderful. Um, there will be a, another generation of kids who are growing up not knowing things that probably a lot of people in the in the room didn't learn until adulthood, if, if at all. Right? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break. I will mention that Cheryl and Sarah and Sandra I think will be around at least during the break. If you uh, did get a chance to ask or, or comment on something that you wanted to. Feel free to approach them uh, and we'll come back. Uh, we're going to aim. I'm going to do this. Uh, we're going to aim to uh, just have a five minute break. So if you can be fairly quick, grab a coffee, use the washroom, have a whatever you need to. Uh, come back in five minutes and we'll start again. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 